and thank you for your enlightenment of the, 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 uh, the lecture that you delivered. It was yeah. good. And so, yes, how would it be better? Do, you, do, you, do we want to be talking like this? Yes. Okay, it's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yes, fine. because, because yeah, that's, that's the whole purpose. Cool. <laughs> good. You know? Okay. So, um, very simple rules. Uh, I will introduce you first yes. uh, for a few seconds, and after yes. that, I'll turn around and then we'll have a conversation. Of course. And uh, that's it. And, but do please uh, throw your voice okay, yes. so that we uh, get the acoustics. Right. Acoustics are good. Yes, fine. Yes. So, so that's how it is. Um, okay. If you're, if you're ready, I'm, I'm ready. ready. Okay. So we just look at the camera for, for a few seconds. Uh, once I count to three, we'll, be, we'll begin. One and two. Hi, welcome to the National Quiz Choice Online News. I'm Robin Steinberg, and welcome to the Steinberg uh, Review column. Uh, today we have uh, Jonathan Mills, who is the festival director and chief executive of Edinburgh International Festival, who has helmed since October 2006. Before this appointment, he was a vice chancellor fellow at the University of Melbourne, director of Alfred Deakin Lectures, and an artistic advisor to the new Melbourne Recital Centre at Elizabeth Murdoch Hall. And bef before that, he was, uh, his, uh, his previous post included Artistic Director of Melbourne International Arts Festival, the Melbourne Federation Festival, the Melbourne Millennium Eve Celebrations, as well as the Brisbane ben Benil International Music Festival. As a composer, he's regularly commissioned in Australia and increasingly in Europe and the United Kingdom. His composition, Shada Khan, a ter a Teranodi for solo tenor, choir, and orchestra, won the Prix Italia in 2005. He's also a visiting professor in both Edinburgh and Edinburgh Napier Universities, a fellow of Royal Society of Edinburgh, and chair of the British Council's advisory board. He was appointed officer of the Order of Australia in Queen's Birthday Honours in 2011. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Mills, thank you for joining us here at the National Prince Choice. Uh, for this type of review uh, column, and today many have asked, you know, about your success uh, being the chief executive for the Edinburgh Festival uh, for a while now, and many would like to know uh, what is the Edinburgh Festival and what has evolved today, you know, and uh, could you give us some insights? I'd be very happy. Um, when people talk about the Edinburgh Festival. They don't exactly know what they mean. I think they know that there is this city called Edinburgh with this fantastic um, celebration for the arts in August. But when they say Edinburgh Festival, do they mean the Fringe, the International Festival, the Book Festival, the Jazz Festival, the Tattoo, the military um, celebration, the Mela, the multicultural celebration, the art festival, which of these do they mean? I believe they mean all of them. Because I think what is so special about Edinburgh in August is the distinctiveness of each of these festivals and the collective um, energy that together they create, the diversity of offerings between the Fringe, the Book Festival, the International Festival, the Tattoo, which are the main festivals the largest, but by no means the only ones. And I think that it's the fact that in Edinburgh there are these many festivals that coincide, all of them independent, but all of them in a sense contributing to this great sense of energy, this great sense of cultural diversity, and this great sense that um, there is no art form, there is no nationality, there is no culture that is not welcome in Edinburgh. The International Festival is the oldest of these um, series of festivals and started in 1947. It started out of a very profound, deep-seated desire to move on, to leave behind the horrors of Auschwitz and Leningrad, to move on from the wholesale slaughter of the Second World War, but to move on in a way that was meaningful, that was not um, uh, ignoring the past, not becoming um, forgetful of, of 
those challenges. To retain that empathy and that desire to, to feel alive, even after most of your family or most of your friends had been killed or maimed by the war. And I think that that profoundly important human instinct gave Edinburgh a special impetus because Edinburgh wasn't the direct result of a promotion of tourism. People weren't um, leaving their homes, they were rebuilding them. So tourism as we know it today didn't exist. It wasn't because there were uh, a surplus of hotel rooms, they hadn't been built. So what was it? It wasn't any of those kind of consumerist creature comforts that we take for granted in our comparatively spoiled lives. It was because people wanted to feel alive. It was because people profoundly felt that they needed to belong to something that was better than themselves, bigger than themselves, an enlargement and a dignifying experience rather than something that was dragging them into something horrible, smaller, um, rancorous and hateful. And you spoke about people wanting to feel alive. How important is that at the time and how relevant it is today? Do, do, do people still want to feel alive? I do believe that people do want to feel alive, do want to feel that they are part of something bigger than themselves. And I think you can demonstrate that by simply referring to the continuing success and continuing popularity of these festivals. These festivals jointly, um, a month ago, will have welcomed one million people, close to one million people, to the city of Edinburgh. And they jointly will have sold close to, or issued close to three million tickets. So I think the statistics in terms of, of an ongoing viability speak for themselves. What I'm trying to say is I want to make a difference. I want to make a distinction between those events that are quite deliberately, quite almost cynically, one might say, devised for utilitarian purposes, and those events that have a real philosophy a real raison d'etre and an, an enduring um, idea of what they are. And I think that that's why Edinburgh continues to work. Now, speaking about Edinburgh uh, Festival itself, when it was first founded, you once said that it was founded because it was founded out of a need to fill the void and not because they are seeking to, to venture out uh, for any form of commercial value also in Well, what I would say is, let's be clear, the commercial value is not refused. The commercial value is not um, unappreciated. The commercial value is understood and it's, and it's measured and, and appreciated for what it is. What I'm saying is that it wasn't a commercial impetus. It was a human impetus that created the event. And as a result, it's hugely popular because it has integrity. It wasn't something that said, we've got this shopping mall to fill, or we've got this void to fill, or this, or this, or this, um, or this surplus of number of rooms, and what do we do with it? It was, we want to be alive. We deeply care about other people's values. We want to learn about them. And so how has that uh, changed from since 1947 to today? Well, we're not fighting each other in Europe, not in the way that we did in 1947. And so, in a sense, what started as a crisis in 1940, sorry, an event that started as a direct result or out of a crisis in 1947, no longer per perceives itself to be either a child of a crisis or necessarily the panacea for a crisis. Let's not, be, let's, let's not um, pretend that there are not massive challenges in Europe today, but there is no crisis in Europe 
in the existential sense that there was a crisis um, in the Second World War. 60 million people haven't um, been embroiled in a conflict or lost, or tens of millions haven't lost their lives. Let's be very clear about that. So when we are, let, let, let's make the rhetoric fit um, the circumstances. So there are challenges in Europe. There are very, very profound challenges of an economic nature, and they could, if not carefully managed, um, turn into something more serious than they are. Not that they're not serious already, but they are of an altogether different dimension than those circumstances that were faced by people as they were um, thinking about how to rebuild their lives in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. And after the Second World War, was Edinburgh was the first choice of location where they need to host the festival? It wasn't a question of first choice because there wasn't, in a sense, your, your question implies that there was a national strategy to start an official festival. There wasn't. A few people got together and said, we want to do something to rebuild our lives. It was much more informal. It was much more under the radar. Um, there's no doubt that official channels were encouraging of this event. There's no doubt that there were people in positions of influence who were encouraging it. But as for an official government policy, it wasn't like that. And in a sense, Edinburgh self-selected, not because there was a poll or a focus group to decide whether this would be a good idea or where, it, whether, which town it should go to. It self-selected for a much more sad reason in a way. If you were proposing to hold a festival, a big, public celebration of the arts, which supposes that you are using theatres and concert halls and recitals halls and town squares and all of this sort of thing, the, the public infrastructure of a town or a city, then there were very few such places that were available in 1947, precisely because of the destruction of the war. You couldn't have done Edinburgh Festival in 1947 in London. There were simply not enough buildings or public buildings available. You couldn't do it um, in so many of the cities that we know today. They had to be rebuilt. Lives had to be redrawn and, and, re, and reconnected. So, and, and if, if that is the case in the United Kingdom, it is even a more stark reality in 1947 for Europe for continental Europe, because when you think about the destruction of France, of Germany, of Russia, of Poland, of, of Czechoslovakia, of the Balkans, of, of, of the Netherlands, um, it was a horrific charred wreck, and it was built up, um, and it emerged from those ashes. What I think people were saying is that if we learn anything from, from a war. We learn our need to feel ourselves to our full extent possible, the dignity of our human existence. So we are not going to be utilitarian in our behavior. We are not simply going to say, we will build a road, and then a hospital, then a school, and then we'll think about the arts. We're saying, we need to think about our humanity and put our humanity into building a road and building a school and building a hospital. And our way of sensing our humanity is through our connection to the arts. And so what point is there having a road if you don't feel alive, if you don't feel human? What point is there having any of that stuff? And so there was a sense that the biggest challenge in that period was feeling human again, human again. And so when I said people were happy to be alive, they felt relieved that they had been spared, probably, but they felt they had an obligation to make it matter 
that they were living, not that the sacrifices had been paid. And speak about sacrifices, you know, uh, how did funding you know, came about for the first festival? It has to be, it has to, it has to be very challenging at the time in 1947. There was no doubt that the amounts of money required to put on the very first festival were tiny in comparison to the amounts of money required to put on the festivals today. There was no economy, and certainly no economy for performing arts as we know it today. We have been the beneficiaries of generations of peace, and with that, a sense of economic uh, aspiration, a sense of economic destiny and future, a sense of employment, a sense of perhaps even, if not entitlement, uh, an accustomed uh, a, a comfort with certain of those entitlements. And of course, when one thinks about that today, one needs to urge a certain amount of caution, a moderation in every way possible to do with these issues of not taking for granted um, our prosperity, our freedom, um, the fact that we are living in still very relatively peaceful and prosperous times. But it's, it's, it is the case, I think it would, be, take, it would make a fascinating study for someone to do the economic modelling of the Edinburgh International Festival in 1947 and to discover what actually was achieved on a very small amount of money. And why was this? I believe it was a number of reasons. The town gave some money. The city of Edinburgh gave some money. The city of Edinburgh gave, um, because it was a tough time in people's lives, a small amount of money. They felt uncertain about their future and so they didn't want to spend money on a festival. A lot of money. It's probably fair to say that the largest contributors to those early festivals were artists themselves and members of the community in Edinburgh. Artists who played for the sheer joy and relief that after so many years of horror, they could play music again, that they could actually be what they wanted to be, musicians or dancers or actors or singers, performers, they actually had a chance to perform and share their skills and knowledge um, with individual people. And so, compared to today, where there are agents and there are managements, and there are a huge range of infrastructure that are attached to every artist, it was a much simpler, much more direct, um, uh, much more rudimentary um, economic circumstance. And then perhaps most uplifting, inspiring, uh, and wonderful of all was the idea that because there were no hotel rooms, people invited others into their homes. I have no doubt that there was a certain degree of thriftiness involved because there was, as I mentioned, food rationing and petrol rationing. The idea that people had to ration their petrol and share a lift with somebody or jump on a bus or jump on a train to get to it. Good thing. Um, it wasn't easy. You had to plan your trip, but it was filled with excitement. And when you, you got there, presumably you had arranged to stay with someone, you'd answer in a hand or you had agreed to stay in the spare room for a few shillings of a nice old lady who was wanting to not be lonely, wanting a few extra 
pieces of money, but also perhaps to share your food coupons with her and others in the house to make a nicer meal. So I think a spirit was built, was started in those early days of the festival that I still feel endures today. That there are people who still are billeted in Edinburgh. There are still people who um, are prepared to, to come to play in Edinburgh in circumstances uh, backstage and in terms of, of the accommodation that is more rudimentary than other places. It's much improved from what it was in 1947. There's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly acceptable. It's, it's, it's very nice. But there's still something frugal and simple and unpretentious about it. And I think it's very, very powerful. More than that, our ticket prices um, are by comparison to most other festivals and most, most other arts organisations very modest. And the reason for this is we believe that people are attending the festival, not a single event. So they are immersing themselves in a multi-dimensional, um, diverse set of experiences. We don't want people to buy a single ticket to a single performance. We want them to buy many tickets to many different performances. <coughs> and so, more than that though, we want to ensure that price is not a barrier. We don't want this to be an elitist club for people who feel that they are entitled to belong to it simply because they're rich. We want people to feel that it's their festival because they're interested in the world, because they're curious about other people's cultures, and that they have a hunger through that curiosity to learn more about other people, other ideas, other customs, other faiths, other philosophies, other songs, other plays, other ways of dancing, other ways of being, other forms of expressing a common humanity. And I think that is the most powerful thing one can offer in a, in a, in a festival like Edinburgh. And that's why our audience is large in comparison to other events of, the, of similar kind. Not just large, but diverse in terms of its makeup. We did an analysis just at the International Festival um, last year and discovered to our surprise that people from 74 different nations buy tickets or bought tickets to the 2011 festival. It will be a similar statistic this year. It might be up a bit. I don't know. But think about that. And speaking about the statistics as well as the success, what it has become today. What kind of challenges do you see and you have overcome in terms of trademarks, patents, uh, copyrights, as well as censorship? Because you know, many of these artists they come with conditions and and and, and also well, burdens as well. The answer to that, there's a very simple answer to that, is we have to be satisfied. The festival has to be satisfied that a particular artist understands the ethos and the spirit of the festival. So in other words, we, we invite them. And if they put too many conditions on that invitation, we don't issue the invitation. We say, no, we invite you on this basis. And if you don't want to come on that basis, well, let's say that we have great respect for you, but you won't be appearing at the festival. And that has on a few occasions, surprise some people who say, I need this and I need this and I need this. And I say, well, it's not the way we operate. I understand that there are other places that do that, but with respect, we don't. Nor do we charge the amount of money that the, uh, these other places charge. Nor do we do this, nor do we do that. We're a different spirit. And if you don't like that, well, we understand. But 
in order to come to Edinburgh, you have to understand what its philosophy is, what its ethos is. And I spent quite a lot of time talking to artists, not only explaining what we're about, but engaging with them in a spirit of generosity about what my ideas for the festival are and how they might think about their own work in relation to a particular journey that constitutes a particular program. You mentioned censorship. There is effectively no censorship on the Ember International Festival. There are laws in the UK, quite strict laws. <coughs> there are laws against racial vilification. There are laws against the vilification of a person on the basis of um, sexual orientation, on the basis of ethnic background, on the basis of religious belief or even a lack of religious belief. So atheists are as welcome as our people who are believing in and, and, and observant members of an organised religion. Where, so, so there is a very clear rule of law. Where there is something that will be controversial, I think it is appropriate for us to warn our audience that some of the content is either unsuitable for children or um, is potentially causing um, offence. I haven't really had to do that very often, not because I've looked for careful or safe choices, I haven't. Um, but most of all, I think I have a rule for myself in terms of censorship. I don't call it that. I call it a rule of ethics, if you like. If I believe that there is a, a piece of art that is calling for or inciting, potentially inciting, some kind of conflict or is, in a sense, um, an incitement to violence of some kind, I think it would be, I would be very reluctant, I would be remiss not to be very reluctant to think very carefully about presenting that work. It can be a fine line. There are some satirical works that are a send-up of hypocrisy. And one should not be so high-minded as to not include the satirical and the humorous in a festival. We have done that particularly this year. Um, but what we do is also subject to an enormous amount of debate, an enormous amount of discussion, and an enormous amount of, of reflection and focus. What we do does, in fact, go to the world. People notice what happens in Edinburgh. <laughs> and so there's a lot of comment and there would be, I think appropriately, a lot of criticism if suddenly the festival was seen to be or perceived to be being used for some kind of indoctrination or some kind of ulterior purpose. I think it's very important that this space for the making of art, the space for the sharing of cultural ideas is a very neutral space and a very open space. And that, from my perspective, means that uh, 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 that is a very exciting place. It means that people who have very little knowledge of what happens in a place like Asia, in the context of the Edinburgh Festival, can learn not only a lot about Asia, which I hope was the case with the 2011 festival, but I hope can learn something about the way in which Asian cultures have had 
some influence and to have some bearing on European ideas, um, on the way in which European composers, playwrights, choreographers, visual artists, textile designers have thought about their work, and equally how that process is reciprocal, how ideas from Europe are actually cherished and, and flourish in Asia. I think that far too often we consider the world in hermetically sealed um, uh, categories, in hermetically sealed compartments. The world isn't like that. One talks about globalization as a recent phenomenon. What about the phenomenon of Christianity as globalization, or Islam, or Buddhism? <laughs> These are far more profound phenomena of globalization than anything to do with pure finance or a world wide web. These are ways in which people profoundly shifted their belief systems and the way in which they behaved because of some idea that was brought to them from somewhere else. And so there is nothing really new in globalization when you think about it in the context of those shifts of humanity. It's said from my own, in the context of my own country, that the moment that Arthur Philip set foot on Sydney Cove in on the 26th of January 1788, that news spread across the various indigenous nations of Australia rather more quickly than any technology has ever done until the provision of something like the internet. And so, um, in a sense, we should not be seduced into thinking that tradition and, and is, is old-fashioned and slow and that in fact our current technological um, circumstances are in some ways special, privileged, unprecedented. Um, I think a degree of humility in thinking about these issues um, from a philosophical position is needed. And I do believe that a festival can offer a glimpse of alternative ways of thinking for an individual to imagine their life, to imagine their way in the world, to imagine the world around them. What kind of challenges do you see as the chief executive of Edinburgh Festival as well as other festivals around the world uh, face today? And what sort of trends do you think uh, the festival is going to evolve? There are a number of challenges. Um, I think that there are going to be um, a number of environmental challenges for a start. The degree to which um, we need in any organisation, whether it be an arts organisation or whether it be um, a school or whether it be a commercial corporate enterprise or a service industry, we need to take a certain responsibility to reduce our carbon footprint. And that is a big challenge for an international festival because I spend a lot of time on an airplane going and finding people to bring to Edinburgh, going and negotiating and engaging with people. And at one level you can say, well, you're bringing a, a smaller group of people in front of a larger group of people. It's true. But I think we need to explore...